the vibes are good. The vibes are still good, people. Joe Spadoni, almost said Joe Shasky again. Two Joe S's. Joe Spadoni in for Bonte Hill. Joe Shasky alongside me. We've been talking Draymond Green. Uh, we'll get back into it. But we're going to be joined here in a few moments by Gabe Kapler, manager of the San Francisco Giants, who are en fuego. Seven straight. Like, say what you want about the star power, all that sort of stuff. At the end of the day, you just want to win damn games. Like, like I don't care how it happens. For the Warriors last year, I'm sure if it was Ty Jerome and Anthony Lamb and they were winning games, we'd be fine with it because they're winning. Winning cures all, and the San Francisco Giants are doing a lot of that right now. 13 games over 500. And Joe Shasky, they're only game and a half back of the Dodgers in that almost pretty nuts. I mean, they're just they're on fire right now. They're playing a really good brand of ball. They're getting contributions from everybody in the lineup. Um, you know, Lamont Wade goes out yesterday. Boom, they don't skip a beat. It's just this team is finding unique ways of winning. My favorite part of the game was the Tyler Rogers inside move. I, I can't tell you, Joey, I can't tell you how many times late in the game, tie game, or we're chasing a run or whatever, a kid gets to second base, and what am I yelling for as the third base coach? Inside move's coming. <laughs> inside move's coming. Then you'll get like a pause in the action. Maybe the, you know, the, the shortstop or the catcher or one of the coaches goes to the mound. You know it's coming. After the review, I could feel that they were going to do something, and Tyler Rogers hit him with that inside move. I'm telling you, it was like, yes, they're going to win this game. And we got our guy, Gabe Kapler, manager of the San Francisco Giants, joining us now here on the morning roast joe spadoni joe shasky how you doing this morning gabe what's up joe and joe i'm doing well i'm actually uh i'm on a, a scooter out here in cincinnati what? getting ready to go grab some coffee before i go to the ballpark how's the weather out there to? how's the weather out there today it's been wet it's been wet uh it's it's cloudy i mean in the midwest in the in the middle of the summer you expect rain every day you just know at some point it's gonna it's gonna open up and hopefully it doesn't cause us any more delays we as you've known, we've we've had a couple of those. Yeah, and I want to ask you about those. How do, how does that affect a locker room or something like that, or your guys trying to stay loose, whatnot? You have the uh, suspended game, then you have to play two in one day, albeit only a couple innings there, and then you got another pushback. How do you let that not affect the guys in the locker room and try to stay loose? There's not much to do. It, this isn't one of those things where you you walk around telling guys what to do. They're they're grown ups. It's Guys are in their like mid twenties to mid thirties, and they know how to prepare for a game. So it's a lot of uh, making sure that they have the start times, obviously. And we get updated on those pretty frequently. We'll have somebody from the grounds crew, or potentially somebody from the red staff, pop into my office and talk about what they think's coming and what we should expect. And then I basically pass that along to our coaching staff, or coaching staff passes it along to the players, but. There's not much more than that. It's pretty straightforward. Um, Gabe, give me the visual. So do you have like a, a coffee or an espresso as you're cruising through the streets of Cincinnati on uh, like a, a scooter here? I, I'm trying to visualize what you're doing here because I follow you on Instagram and you're quite the follow. I appreciate that. I know um, no on the scooter because I have my phone in one hand. It's my <laughs> left hand on the, the handlebars and I got to control the brake and the and the, the gas, but when I'm on a bicycle, I'll do it as long as it's safe and I'm uh, not putting anybody else in harm's way. Yeah. Take a coffee, ride a bike leisurely. Why not? I love that. No, I love that. I, I'm turning into an espresso guy myself. Uh, but yesterday, I got fired up. Not, not like espresso shot fired up, but just fired up when uh, uh, Ellie De La Cruz stole second base. Bailey gunned him down. They reviewed it. He gets overturned. He goes to second base. And I'm thinking... Great time right now. Do a pickoff play. It's a young player. He's super aggressive. He took a big secondary lead before Taylor Rogers or Tyler Rogers even started to go home. You hit him with the inside move. That was the play of that game. That was incredible. Did that come from you? It actually came from Mark Hallberg, who does a great job of controlling the running game. And I'll say this: we had an advanced meeting before the series, and we were talking about the young, athletic fast wedge and how aggressive they are on the bases and you know you could look at that in one of two ways the first way is they're, they're going to hurt you with stolen bases they're going to hurt you going first to third first to home they're probably going to take advantage of balls in the dirt and the other way to look at it is there's going to be some opportunities um with some over aggressiveness and our coaches have done an incredible job in this series being aware of that and picking the right time we had another pickoff uh last night with sean and i mm -hmm. and i wasn't able to complete yeah. the play 
me just kind of got a little fast there for a moment. But, um, yeah, no, really nice job by our coaches. A really good job by Tyler Rogers executing on that play. We practiced it all spring training. You really have to sell that inside move. Mm. If it looks even remotely different than delivery to the plate, you're tipping off the base runner. He's getting back safely. So just really well executed across the board. Um, good rundown. Brett Wisely chose the right time to throw a pump fake in there. Because Dela Cruz can shake you, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, Wilmer Flores is running the ball. Wilmer's not particularly fast. Dela Cruz is lightning fast. Getting the ball into the fastest infielder's hand was Brett Wisely. And then him completing the play was was really gratifying for everybody on the field. Yeah, no, I mean, I loved it. I mean, and I was telling Joey, I, I can't tell you how many times my 12U team, close game, they get to second base and they're they're hitting the gritty or they're doing the bow and arrow. I'm like, dog, don't get picked off here. What are you doing? And young players get over-aggressive even though they're in scoring position. How, how much has Patrick Bailey helped you in terms of holding runners on and controlling the run game? Because early on in the year, it was a struggle defensively from the catcher spot. I didn't think the pitchers did a, a relatively good job setting the catchers up, but Bailey's athleticism, his arm, the ability to get rid of the ball, it's been a game changer behind the plate. Yeah, Pat's been all of those things and more. So let me start by giving him a ton of credit. You know, he's got an incredible pop time, great arm strength, incredible accuracy with his throws. Just want to make sure I love on him for a minute there and, and support what you're saying. But you're right. The pitchers have such a huge role in controlling the running game. Uh, we had uh, Craig Abernath, one of, uh, one of our coaches, our, our catching coach and uh, part of our pitching group. Uh, he was out for a couple of days. And uh, he was, he was, his wife was having a, a baby and she had a little complication. So it took him a while to get back to, to the team. In the meantime, we had a, a minor league coach uh, come in and fill in for, for Albion. And this coach and I were having conversations about controlling the running game and, and particularly how we teach it at the minor league level. Such a big deal. We need our pitchers coming up to the major league level. Um, they, we like them to be in the, in the range of 1.3 to 1.5. 1.3 to 1.5 seconds and how long it takes them to deliver the baseball to the, to the plate once they start their delivery. If they're north of that, it makes it really difficult, mm. even with Pat Bailey and all his ability to throw out a, a base runner at second base. So our pitchers have done a really nice job of growing in that regard. Uh, Mark Hallberg, as I mentioned, our third base coach is right on top of it. Craig Albernaz, our pitching coach, Andrew Bailey. All of those guys are on top of, of controlling the running game. It doesn't just have to be the catcher, and, and I'm glad we're taking steps forward in that regard. Gabe Kapler, manager of the San Francisco Giants, joining us now on the morning roast. And speaking of Patrick Bailey, he's been such a key cog for this team. Like the him coming up, felt like it changed everything, not just for the pitchers, the hitters, everything. And Dave Fleming, who obviously voiced one of the Giants, NBC Sports Bay Area, he joined us yesterday, and he said he's starting to notice maybe a little signs of some wear and tear. Obviously, it's a young guy getting his first taste in the big leagues. How do you balance keeping a guy like Patrick Bailey fresh for the rest of the season while keeping his bat and his defense still in that lineup, Gabe? Man, it's a huge challenge because you want him back there in every inning of every game. Uh, you want him in every big at bat. I mean, we saw last night, came in and covered three innings of the game late for all the reasons that I just mentioned. And he almost hit another big home run to right center field and uh, was kind of robbed of, of an extra base hit out there. Really nice play. But, um, yeah, Pat, Pat, we want him out there all the time. And at the same time, we have to keep, keep the long view in mind. So what I'd share with you guys is if he's not on the field, that's workload, man workload mm -hmm. management. If there's a big spot where you wish, you wish you had Pat Bailey up at the plate and he's not up at the plate, that's workload management. It's not because we don't want him in there. Very similar to what we did with Buster Posey in 2021, we kind of had to map out his off days, and on his off days, we had to keep him off the field sometimes. Um, and, you know, if it was a big moment, Buster would come in and, and take down a pinch hit at back. But we're going to have to look at Pat in, in a similar way. We just... We have to have this guy in August. We have to have him in September and beyond. And, and so we're going to have to, at times, take it on the chin because he's not available for a big at bat or, or to, to throw out a runner. But the, the flip side of that is we really trust Blake Sable. This guy's done a tremendous yeah. job for us. Um, you know, there are some question marks coming into the season. I think he's answered those. He's an adequate major league catcher. Not saying he's Patrick Bailey. 
but he does a nice job for us back there, and he's really swung the bat well against right-handed pitching throughout the season. Yeah, yeah. You know, Gabe, I think there's too much made of how analytically driven you guys are, and and I do believe, I mean, you're a baseball player at heart, right? Obviously, you, you, you're, you're pouring into the data as well. I look at someone like Michael Conforto. And, like, the average and the RBIs, it doesn't speak to how clutch this dude has been all year. Coming through big-time hit after big-time hit in big-time situations. How big has Michael Conforto been for you guys this year? Yeah, Mike Mike has come up big in clutch situations, as you mentioned. Um, and, and it seems like when he's up at the plate in a big spot, he's just so relaxed. I think it's one of the things that allows him to be good. Um, and... I guess another reason he's good in the clutch is this guy's played on the biggest stage, in the biggest moments. Um, yeah, he's just like a lot of experience. One of the sweetest, most mechanically sound swings in baseball. You don't see that swing every day. Um, so those are the reasons that, that he's so good in those spots. And he's an excellent person. Just off the charts, teammate, human being, so fun to be around. Always got a smile, always engaged. Really, really good get for us. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, to kind of further that, like, you got to watch the at bats and you got to watch the games and how they play out. Casey Schmidt has obviously been struggling. I'm, I'm looking at the batting average right now and he's 10 for his last 75, but I watch every game. I watch every at bat and I'm seeing growth at the plate. I'm seeing more discernment. I know the results aren't there. How do you guys balance process over results and trying to not have him lose his confidence while still playing at the big league level and trying to adjust? It's It's got to be a very delicate situation. Well, uh, JT needs experience, first and foremost. We need to try to get him as many reps as possible. We need to hang in there with him as he goes through these struggles because so many young players uh, experience what he's experiencing and come out the other side better for it. Uh, We'd like to see JT just relax a little bit, right? And it's way easier said than done. I remember being a player myself, having coaches, you know, they come up to me and say, like, hey, man, just, just relax at the plate. But, yeah, show me how to relax at the plate when I'm facing this dude throwing 95, the ball's moving all over the place, and the likelihood is I'm going to fail in front of 40,000 people. So it's, it's just not, it's not that easy, but really the goal is for Casey to be just a little bit calmer in the batter's box, a little bit calmer at shortstop third base, second base, a little bit calmer in between innings. So we're working on that with him. He's working on it himself but it's not a turnkey thing and and we just have to hang in there with him as he goes through this this struggle our our hitting coaches are doing a really nice job of giving him cues and and casey himself is relentless in his pursuit of improvement so a lot of respect for him really happy he's here and know he's going to be a good major leaguer for a long time Manager of the San Francisco Giants with us right now on the morning roast, Gabe Kapler, just a game and a half back of the Los Angeles Dodgers for first in the NL West. Red Hot right now have won seven in a row. And Gabe, I want to ask you about the starting rotation. Where are you at with your guys at the top of this rotation? Obviously, you got Webb, Mm. you got Cobb. They're studs. They're ballers. They've been awesome all year uh, long. Cobb, all-star, been having a fantastic season. Di Sclafani got a little roughed up last night. Stripling, uh... It's been tough sometimes for him. Where are you at with some of your guys down the stretch here in the second half of this season? Today's a big, a big day for us. Strips on the mound. Um, I, I'm sure everybody has seen the struggles that, that Ross has had through the season. But hopefully, folks have noticed that he's really ticked up uh, as of late. So just taking any, any listeners back to last year, Ross was one of the better pitchers in the Blue Jays rotation. So, and that's a, a pretty good team in the American League. East. came out with really good numbers. We pursued him for a couple of reasons. Number one, he's a strike thrower. Number two, he gets lefties out. And number three, he's about as competitive a teammate as you'll, you'll ever see. So, yeah, he got off to a tough start, but we believe in strip in the biggest way. We can get the ball again today, and we just hope that he continues his improvement and recaptures the form that he had last year because if he does, He's a great middle of the rotation starter, so that's that's the first answer to the question. You know, Manaya has not had the best year so far, but all the talent is intact. We need to keep giving him the ball and giving him opportunities to perform. Um, Alex Wood, proven track record of being a major league starter. The best thing that can happen for us is these guys can recapture their best form. I believe that they can. Anthony, as you mentioned, had a rough start last night. 
it's been a tough run for him. I don't think there's any disputing that. But again, go back to 2021. He was one of our best pitchers. We don't have that historic season without him right in the middle mm. of the rotation. So the talent is there. We just, we're looking forward to emerge more consistently with a few of our guys. All right, Gabe, I'm going to butter you up before I ask you the tough question and pretend like I'm a journalist here. When you are posting videos of you sipping, I don't know if it's whiskey or scotch <sighs> or brandy, and, and, and you've got this unbelievable medium rare, I mean, it was damn near still walking, cheeseburger that looked incredible. Are you finding these places on Yelp? Is this word of mouth? Are you a quote-unquote foodie? Like, how are you finding these little hole-in-the-wall spots? Um, I get some recommendations. I'll, I'll ask people that I'm close to. I'll ask people on social media. I have a lot of fun with it. So I get recommendations from all over the place. And then what you don't see is when I go in and I take a video of a burger, I take a video of a scotch or a coffee, and I don't like it, I don't post it. <laughs> so I, o- I only, like, I have so much video in my phone of these food experiences, of these coffee experiences, of these scotch experiences. And I do, most of the time I do nothing with them because I'm not going to fake it, right? Yes. If I, don't think, if I don't think the place is at least an A-, minus, I'm not even going to mess around. So Interesting. Um, yeah, so I, I have a lot of meals before I decide, hey, I, I really like this place. I want to support this place, give them a little love and attention. And I honestly, at the end of the day, I've had so much fun with it. And yeah, it's, it's a it's a fun little hobby. Gabe, I, I would I'm being serious. I'm a huge Anthony Bourdain guy. R.I.P. Like yes. I would watch that show constantly. No reservations. Everything. He, every his show on CNN. I would watch his show with you going out to local places. A Guy Fieri esque with the diner drive. Oh, it would be with incredible. Me? Would you ever consider doing something like that? You Alone. know, post managing or even hell during the off season doing a little show like that. It, it, it's a great question because, I, I mean, it, that would be, like, one of the things that I, I love is, like, just traveling, eating, yeah. sharing ex- sharing experiences. And, like, I would like to do it in, in different parts of the world as well. And I will. The, the, trick, the trick here is the videos that I do on Instagram, they take me, like, five minutes. I can do them in no time flat. I'm recording, like, a 15-second to 30-second voiceover. It's so easy, right? But the minute you start to try to create actual long, um, long form content, like the show you're talking about, it's a full-time job. And I spend 99.9% of my time, you know, talking to players, planning for, for games and like this tiny little sliver, I can, I can have this hobby, but what Guy Fieri does with Anthony Bourdain did, like those are, they they dedicated their life to it. You know what I mean? Yep. Well, uh, open invitation this 49er season. If there's a game you want to go to, you and me will go perusing through the parking lot oh, and we'll go out and we'll check out people's tailgates. Open invitation. You let me know what works for you. It'll probably be never because you wouldn't want to be around me. But you and I could go to the Niner game. You'd have much better seats than me. I sit in the end zone way up top, but it's where the people sit. And I, I, <laughs> I'm telling you, we can make content gold. But here's where I got to ask you the tough question, Gabe. I got to ask you a tough one. You played forever. You, you've been managing for quite some time. There's a Draymond Jordan pool thing that's been happening with the Golden State Warriors. We've been talking about it all morning and it feels like, you know, there's just been a lot of locker room stuff, clubhouse stuff, where there are egos and friendships and alliances and allegiances. How do you navigate that? How do you navigate that as a player? How do you navigate that as part of the management, as part of the coaching staff? It's got to be difficult. Well, the first thing I'll say is I'm not up to speed because um, like I said, like most of my time is spent on baseball. And so while I do like other sports and I follow the Warriors, I follow the Niners, I don't, I'm not following closely right now. So I don't know what's going on. Well, so two you're guys have had to a fill me in or give me a little bit two more guys, yeah. specific. Two guys had a fallout, and it got a little physical, and now they're going on different athletes' podcasts, and they're kind of talking about the situation, and it feels like it torpedoed the season. Yeah, yeah. Um, to be honest, like I haven't experienced that level of, of discourse in a Major League Baseball clubhouse. And look, I've seen physical confrontations in Major League clubhouses, as both as a player mm. and as managers. You mm. know, things get heated, but most of the time it gets kept pretty under wraps, and we're able to to kind of you know get it squashed and taken care of in house. So it's just hard for me to speak to a situation that I know sure. very little about. 
and I actually think it's kind of irresponsible. I need to know, I would need to know more and I would need to have a little context. It just doesn't feel like the right thing to do for me to like jump in here without having the information. Totally fair. And and if I, you know, I wasn't trying to railroad you or set you up. We're just looking for some, you know, context from another sport. Yeah. No, there's, there's those situations pop up so infrequently. Gotcha. Um, there's, there's just not, there's not, not much to go on here. If I think of something, I'll reach back out at the right time yeah. and give you some, some, yeah, no, uh, yeah, we could do it yeah, during my, our my, tailgate my, segment my, when we're out at a Niner game. <laughs> Ripping the Philadelphia Eagles. Relax over there. These shameless plugs. My goodness. Gabe, <laughs> Gabe Kapler joining us here on the morning roast, manager of the San Francisco Giants, who have again won seven in a row. And Gabe, uh, real quick, uh, Brandon Crawford, what is his status right now? I know he was expected to play over in uh, Pittsburgh. He had this uh, th- something going on with his knee, pre existing injury th- uh, from before the season. What's going on with uh, Brandon Crawford? Yeah, uh, Brandon and I talked last night. His knee's banged up. Um, I, I don't think it's going to feel great today, but when he comes in, we're going to, we're going to check it out. Our trainers are going to take a look at him and we'll see what the, the best course of action is. And I know he really wants to help our team right now. I know it's tough, uh, for Brandon to kind of be in the dugout and, and not being able to contribute last night. I mean, as you saw, we had Jock at first base. Um, and, that, and that's because like, you know, Brandon, was was in a spot where he wasn't able to, to help, and I know that's really hard for him because he wants so much to be a part of what's going on and to contribute to wins. So we'll just have to chat um, a little bit later on this afternoon and, and make the best decision for, for the Giants. Hey, Duvall pitching twice in one day. W- was there any reservations, hesitations at all? I know a lot of people, oh, my God. I mean, I, I don't think it's that much. Guys get up and get ready for a game multiple times within a couple-hour frame. I, I didn't think much of it. Did Did you guys think twice about it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, very, very similar to the Bailey conversation, right? You're trying to win a baseball game. You have this path to winning a baseball game. You got one of the best closers in baseball and you're protecting a one run lead on the road and everything is on the line. So you have a choice, right? What's best for Camilo physically in that situation, probably take the second game off, right? Get ready for tomorrow's game. What's best for the giants in that situation is definitely to have Camilo come in and close that game out. He had great stuff, obviously like, uh, you know, up to 101, the cutter was working, the sinker was working, the slider looked great, looked like his stuff was normal. So how do you make that decision? The way you make that decision is what does the player want? Because you can add psychological component to the upside for the player. So now you're Camilo Do- Doval, you feel like you can give us that inning, but not only give us that inning, but want to give us that inning. You get this unique opportunity to have to record two saves in one 24-hour period, which very rarely happens. And, you know, you're like, I, I, I want the ball. So we give him the ball because there's, there is that upside for Camilo. And now what we have to do on the other side is say, you know, Camilo might not pitch for us today. We know that that's the trade-off. Now, we might not be in a safe situation today, but that's just something that we're going to have to examine. And, and you know what? We won't rule anything out. Camilo comes to us and says, hey, I feel good. I, I feel like I want to pitch. And then maybe give him Sunday off. We'll do that. But if if there's a safe situation today, if there's a big moment in the game and Camilo does not come into the game because we're protecting him, we're, we're working through game load management and um, it is, it is a bit of a tricky balance. Yeah. Gabe Kapler joining us here on the morning. Awesome. Gabe, you've been awesome. You've, we really appreciate your time here. You've been great. This has been awesome. One more for you on your way out. I'm watching this guy show. Hey, Oh my goodness. And I, you listen, you live, you breathe baseball, you are you've played, you've managed. I'm only 30 years old, so I can't speak to the guys before me, the Willie Mazes, the the Babe Ruths, anything. What I've seen from this guy just in this 3-year stretch alone is some of the greatest, if not the greatest stretch of baseball I have ever seen, ever witnessed. I think he may be the most talented baseball player of all time. Can you just share your thoughts on what you have seen? From Shohei Otani? I think this is a really interesting discussion. Um, yeah, I think he's probably the most talented, all around most talented baseball player um, in history. That's my, probably my bet. I, you know, I'm not going to go through every, every player <laughs> and, and compare them, but it's, that's a fair statement, um, in, in my opinion. The interesting part is 
that his teammate Mike Trout might go down as the best player of all time when it's all said and done. <laughs> so what we're, what we're seeing with the Angels is guys hitting like back to back, and obviously Trout's not at his healthiest, but got two guys hitting back to back: Mike Trout, Shohei Otani. Arguably, you know, this could be two of the greatest players that ever lived hitting in the same lineup at the same time. So I, I find that to be kind of cool. People have stopped talking about Trout as much with Shohei there. But, man, this is, this is the best baseball player I've ever seen is Mike Trout. Wow. That's a statement you, right you there. You really think over Bonds, over Verlander? Like, I mean, obviously pitching and hitting are, are two different things. You, you got Mike Trout, huh, over Griffey? I mean, you've seen a lot of them. I respect this. Pujols, Cabrera. Yeah, I mean, look, I played with I played with Alex Rodriguez. I played with Manny Ramirez. I played with Pedro Martinez. I played with wow. Todd Helton. I mean, I, there's a pretty decent list of guys <laughs> that I've played with that I've seen up close for long periods of time in person. Now, I haven't seen as much of Gary Bonds because our careers didn't overlap gotcha. quite in the same way. But I haven't seen Mike shot a little bit more up close and personal. I, I have Mike as the best player that I've ever seen play baseball. I love that. Wow. What, now i got to ask you one last question because I play this game all the time. My life on the line, I'm taking 2010 Lincecum from the playoffs to pitch that game. Who is the guy with your life on the line of all the guys you've either faced or seen that you're handing the ball to? This is going to sound crazy, but it's just because it was a brief snapshot in time in 2008. I was playing with uh, the Milwaukee Brewers. And CC Sabathia was, um, we, we acquired CC at the trade deadline. And it seemed like he pitched on short rest <laughs> every time through and just absolutely slayed the league. It was the, it was the most impressive pitching performance I've ever seen. Now, as I mentioned, I played with Pedro, I played with Kirk Schilling, uh, I played with some, some pretty good pitchers over the years. But for me, it was that stretch of, performance by CC Sabathia that stands out. That's incredible. Man. Thank you for your time, Thank Gabe. you so much, Gabe. Appreciate the time, man. Best of luck incredible. in the second half. Yeah, enjoy it, guys. We'll talk soon. Have a good Thanks, one. Keep man. them rocking, man. man. Eight in a row. I want it. Let's, Let's go. go. That's Gabe Kapler, manager of your San Francisco Giants. Man, he's a cool guy. Jade, my wife,